The morning and this meeting of the Investment Committee is now being recorded for record-keeping purposes. By participating in the session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and future viewing of this meeting. This meeting is now being live streamed. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? I, I mentioned a little earlier I'm having some technical issues here, so I'm doing this over my phone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Thanks. Well, good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, call to order uh, this June 8, 2021 meeting of the PA SERS uh, Retirement System uh, Investment Committee. And first order of business is may we have a, a roll call vote, please. Terry? Yep, yep. I'll take care I'll of take that, care of Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, you're here, obviously. You're here, obviously. Here? Yep. Here. Senator DeSanto. This is Chuck Erdman for Senator DeSanto. Thank you, Thank Chuck. You, Chuck. Mr. Feldman. Mr. Feldman. Present. Representative, Representative Frankel. Frankel. Uh, Dan Ocko as his designee. Thanks, Present. Dan. Treasurer, Treasurer Garrity. Garrity. I'm here. Thank you. Senator. 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 Oh, sorry. sorry. Senator Hughes. Senator Hughes. Hi, I'm Tony here for Senator Hughes. Hello, Tony. Tony. Uh, uh, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. Here. Mr. Thal. Mr. Thal. Here. The Secretary Begg. Secretary Begg. Uh, this is Alan Flanagan. I'm here on Secretary Begg's behalf. Okay, thank you, okay, Alan. Thank you, Alan. All right, we're All right, complete. 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 Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, we will have the approval of the April 28, 2021 uh, committee meeting minutes. And so, uh, may, may I have a motion, please? So moved. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Okay, hearing none, the motion has passed. Uh, we have no uh, old business. Uh, we'll move on to uh, new business. Uh, we have uh, two updates by the investment office. We have the quarterly investment performance analysis by Callan for the defined benefit, the deferred comp, and the defined contribution plans. Uh, we have a private equity opportunity with Insight Partners 12 LP and then several informational items. So for this, I'll turn it over to our uh, Chief Investment Officer, Chef Kelly, and the Investment Office. So please take it away. Thanks, Glenn. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> and I will immediately turn it over to Bill Trong to talk about the fixed income transition so you, you guys know how it's coming along and where we're at. Uh, Bill, are you there? I am. All right. Take it away, buddy. All right, thanks. Uh, good morning, Chairman Becker and committee members. Uh, this morning, I'm providing a brief update on the fixed income transition. The uh, fixed income transition presentation is located in board docs in the investment committee section, and it is under item 5A. Please turn to slide one. Last December, the board approved a restructure of the old fixed income structure. The old fixed income structure is located on the left-hand side of the table, and the new fixed income structure is located on the right. Please turn to page four. The transition to the new page, uh, I'm sorry, page three. Thank you. Uh, the transition to the new fixed income structure is on target. We started the transition in March, and at this time, we are approximately 35% complete. The ring charts on the slide show our progression. Our target is to be com uh, completed by July of 2020 2022. In regards to our search for the active long credit mandates, staff and Callan started the search process in March. We are in the final phases of our due diligence and interviews. Uh, staff and Callan plan to provide recommendations to this investment committee over the next couple of weeks. I'm happy to answer any questions, and if there are no questions, I will turn it over to Jim to discuss our rebalancing transactions since the last board meeting. Thank you for your time. Uh, 
Okay, if you would uh, reference the rebalancing presentation in uh, under Section 5A in board docs, and Kelly has it up on the screen as well. Thank you. Uh, if you flip to page one, we'll just do a quick recap. This was a unusual rebalance because we received that uh, advanced pre-funding contribution from PASHI. As you see on the third bullet point, uh, $825 million came in. Uh, now, Sarah and the group kept us informed along the way, so we were able to get uh, several recommendations in the set for review and arrived at a uh, optimal, what we believe to be an optimal allocation and, and uh, investment of this money. Uh, and, and of course, worked with Callen and they concurred with that. So this deck will give you just a high level recap of what happened, uh, how we, how we uh, allocated that money. Uh, as the last bullet point shows there, you'll see increases on all the asset classes, as you might expect when you're adding a significant amount to the fund. Uh, but down at the bottom of the last bullet, cash uh, was a little bit over. So we were just trying to keep that targeted. As we all know, cash can be a drag uh, if left uninvested with the low rate of return associated with that. If we turn to the next page, you'll see an, our team put together a couple of different snapshots for your uh, digestion of this information. This is the asset class view uh, at a high level, and you can see the, alloca the allocation before in the pink column in the center, pink and green, uh, the actual cash that was transacted in the adjustment column. And then finally to the right, you can see the resulting uh, variance versus the targets. And you can see they're very tightly uh, fit into the targets. That's been something set, that Seth has been focused on since he joined here. Uh, and you all have approved the rebalancing po uh, policy that provides him the tool and pathway to be able to do that. Any questions at this point? If not, we can go to the next page. This is the same information, but it's just broken out. And the uh, format that we have been provided, providing to this board over the last couple of years, thinking in terms of return seeking and capital preservation buckets, uh, this gives you a sense of sort of the break the glass uh, liquidity that would be available for the system down under the cash preservation section as opposed to the uh, return seeking segments above. Uh, that's where we're trying to achieve the expected rate of return from those assets, not so much the capital preservation. And then the last page is the same thing in asset I'm sorry, Kelly, that'd be page four. Uh, that would be the same asset class breakdown, but showing you strategy by strategy uh, where those dollars were invested. And that wraps up this presentation, unless there's any questions. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so next we have the uh, investment performance from Callan, and, and Tom's going to start that. So. Tom, uh, table's yours, and then you can progress through um, Bud and Britt as you see fit. Okay. Thank you, Seth. Good morning, everyone. Tom, I, Tom, you there? Looks like Tom's uh, video froze. I'm sure he's going to try to come back. Uh, maybe we could move to the uh, deferred comp, uh, which I'll cover, and the DC plan, which I'll also cover, and then Tom will hopefully be back by then to cover the DB plan. Yeah, that, that's good audible. Uh, why don't we do that? Okay. 
you could go to the uh, 457 deferred comp plan. Yeah, but that is item 5C in Border Docs for deferred compensation plan. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm going to ask you to skip ahead. Uh, Tom's going to cover the uh, capital market review for the quarter in his presentation. So uh, if I could turn your attention to page 11, it's PDF 12, but page 11 going by the bottom right hand corner. This page shows the, uh, the current asset allocation of all previous contributions and capital market moves on the left hand side. And then uh, on the right, the pie chart shows the latest quarterly contributions uh, for March 31. Uh, I guess what you could see here is that uh, comparing the two pie charts, there's a little bit less going into the U.S. large cap index fund um, and a little bit less going into the retirement date funds um, with more going into stable value, short term, and the U.S. bond index fund for the last quarter compared to historical allocations. Uh, if you move to page 12, uh, this shows the assets as of the end of the quarter versus uh, the previous quarter. Um, there was a net new investments of a negative 14,000, uh, but there was positive investment return of 133,000, and total assets as of the end of March were $4.4 million. Uh, turning to the next page, the top chart represents the changes in market values uh, as of the end of the quarter, and this represents a combination of three different things, the investment returns of each fund, the participant contributions, distributions and withdrawals, and then also transfers between funds by participants. And uh, you know, mainly due to the market movements, the equity funds had the biggest uh, change in market values from a positive point of view with uh, limited increases in the other options. Uh, the bottom chart on page 13 gives you a, a look at the historical allocations of contributions over time. Uh, they've been pretty steady over the last four quarters with a uh, you know, pretty big change there at the end of 2020, but pretty steady since then. Page 14 represents a look at the Black Black Life Path Retirement Fund's uh, Glide Path, which shows the allocations to the broad asset classes uh, U.S. equity, non-U.S. equity, domestic fixed income, and so on, uh, and then how that allocation rolls down over time. So the further you are from retirement, there's a lot more equity in the portfolio, and as you get closer to retirement, the amount of fixed income increases and equity decreases. Uh, the bottom chart reflects how BlackRock compares to other uh, target date funds in our peer group, and the Callan consensus is the average allocations within the peer group. So what you can see is that uh, you know 40 years until retirement, BlackRock has more equity than uh, the consensus, and near the top of the peer group as far as the amount of equity, and that begins to roll down. You know, probably around the 20 five years before retirement. Uh, it begins to reduce equity at a higher pace than the peer group around uh, 20 years from retirement. It actually gets below the peer group around five years from retirement and in fact gets uh, below that at retirement date. But then it stays at that level of equity. So through retirement, it actually has more equity than the peer group 
So it's uh, that explains a lot of the performance that we'll look at when we look at the different um, fun vintages. If I can flip the head now to the uh, stoplight pages that we call them on page 19. And here we are comparing all of the, um, on this page, all of the uh, retirement date vintages versus the um, index. And as you know, the BlackRock funds are index funds that are that's how they're implemented. And so you see a very tight tracking error versus their blended index. Um, across the board for all the the time periods as well as all the vintage years. If it's a <clears throat> green box, it represents that it's uh, above median against the peer group. Uh, if it's yellow, it's in the below median in the third quartile. And uh, if it's red, it's below median in the fourth quartile. So some of the uh, funds that are closer to retirement um, or at retirement, they're showing below median, given that they have a little bit less in equity uh, than some of the peers, as we saw in the drawdown analysis. Um, and also with the fact that there is not active management, some funds that have active management have outperformed. And then although there is the, uh, at the high level, we talked about how much is in equity versus fixed income. Um, you know, there's different ways of investing in equity. There's the, what the mix of, of U.S. versus non-U.S., how much in emerging markets. Um, so that explains uh, deviations in performance. Uh, the fees, the expense ratios, and the fee comparison is in the far right uh, column. And uh, given that they are implemented with index funds, even with index funds, they are very low uh, comparable in the peer group. The next page, page 20, uh, continues with the last uh, retirement date fund. And then we have the uh, standalone options in domestic equity, international equity, and domestic fixed income. The bond funds, uh, well, the stable value has uh, performed very well. It's uh, in the top decile, it includes really the top performing fund in our peer group over longer periods. And the U.S. bond index fund is showing uh, consistent uh, fourth quartile performance. That represents that uh, the fact that active management in U.S. bond market has paid off much more than investing in a index fund in that area of the marketplace. It's not always the case, but over long periods of time, that tends to be the case. On page 21, uh, again, I refer to the performance of the stable value fund, and this is how it uh, stacks up versus our peer group of other stable value managers. Very top-notch performance. That concludes my comments on the deferred comp plan. Stop there and see if there's any questions before I turn to the 401A defined contribution plan. Okay, hearing none, if I can uh, have you move to page 11. Again, for this plan, looking at the asset allocation on the left side, versus the most recent level of contributions. I'm sorry, this is still the 457. If you can go into the 401A, page 11. Yeah, that'll be 5D in board docs, the DC quarterly investment report. Thanks, Jim. So on the left, you see that historically the uh, asset allocation has predominantly been in the target date funds. Uh, the most recent contributions show a little bit less going into retirement date funds, a little more going into the short-term investment and the fixed income funds. 
but certainly the majority, the heavy majority is still going into the retirement date funds. Page 12 <clears throat> shows the change in assets between December and, and March. Um, here we're seeing much more in the way of net new contributions, net new investments of close to 7 million and an investment return of 1.5 million and total assets are up to 44.2 million as of the end of March. Uh, page 13 has the change in market values and contributions. Uh, the heavy majority of uh, new contributions going into the retirement date funds shows that that's where the heavy increase in assets are. Uh, at the bottom of page 13 shows the historical look at the uh, contributions. And uh, again, it's mainly been going into the <clears throat> retirement date funds with a little pickup in some of the other funds, fixed income funds over the last quarter. We talked about the roll down of the BlackRock fund. Um, so I'll skip over that and I can uh, move you to page 19 again for the stoplight pages. And again, all the uh, retirement date funds are the same as we saw in the 457. Um, and you can see the corresponding colors and how they rank in the peer group. The absolute numbers, um, you know, as, as Tom will talk about when he goes through the uh, economic market and capital market review, the performance of equities over the last year over year performance from the end of March of 2020 to the end of March of 2021 was huge. Uh, you can see really big numbers in the equity markets um, and also in the retirement date funds that have a heavy allocation to equities. And uh, historical numbers, given that uh, equities have performed very well over the last 10 years, um, shows very strong performance for all the funds um, in the retirement date vintages. And then moving to domestic equity um, on page 20. So the other asset classes within domestic equity, you have the large cap fund, you have the all company fund, which is not in the 457, but that's all in the green across all the uh, time periods. Uh, the U.S. small and mid, mid cap fund is also in the green. Again, these are, are implemented through index management, so there's no active management, but it just tells you that um, in these areas of the marketplace and domestic equity, um, active management has underperformed index funds. In the bond market, that is not always the case, as I mentioned before. Um, and then you see the, the two short-term, um, well, the, the one U.S. short-term bond fund uh, towards the bottom of page 20 has performed well and is uh, in the top uh, quartile over the quarter and one year, top above median over the three-year. And the TIPS fund, which is uh, not in the 457, uh, has a negative return for the quarter. Um, but up seven and a half for the last year and five seven for the three year, which puts it back above median. Happy to answer any questions here. Hopefully Tom's back to do the DB plan, but uh, pause here for any questions. Dave Philman has a question. Yeah, yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, the 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 contributions the vast majority into the retirement date funds and we are just you know sort of new in this as far as a 401a is this typical of most plans that uh, there is a vast majority that go into the retirement date funds yes it is especially when it's the default if someone doesn't choose how they want to allocate their assets and uh and you have a default option which is typically the target date funds, that's where most of the money is gonna go. Okay, thanks. Tom, are you back? Yes, 
can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I apologize. My team's uh, had a glitch, it appears, so I'm here. <clears throat> if you want to do the DB. Uh, whoever's controlling the, uh, the uh, report, you can go to the DB. Go to the DB. Okay, thank you. If you go to the next page, please. Next page. Thank you. So this is showing the performance out to 25 years, and this is truly a remarkable period of returns. If you think about this endpoint, it really matters. Endpoints always matter in measuring performance, but particularly in this type of environment that we've been in. So if you think about that trough, where we had a bear market into March of last year and then the recovery that started. We saw a lot of support from the Federal Reserve and fiscal uh, stimulus as well. And the markets responded as we were going through the pandemic. So if you look at these one-year numbers, they are extremely strong. Russell 3000, that's the broad U.S. equity market, was up over 62%. The large cap market was not up as much trailed at 56%. Small cap stocks led the way at almost a 95% return for the last year. And that did benefit SERS in the plan. There's a structural overweight to small cap stocks, so having that overweight did benefit performance. And then in non-U.S. markets, in dollar terms, they weren't as strong, but they were still extremely strong uh, on an absolute basis. World X USA, what does that mean? That's referring to developed non-US markets up 46%. Emerging markets up even more, 58%. And the, the, that next index is the small cap non-US index. So it was a similar dynamic to what we saw in the United States where the smaller companies did better uh, coming in out of the pandemic, not that it's over, but in terms of vaccines being approved and starting to see economic recovery. And then bond returns were very muted. The aggregate was barely positive, 0.71%. That protected very well in the first quarter of last year. And it had a good year for the calendar year last year, but this year so far we've seen rates rise. And that you can see reflected in the one quarter return for the aggregate of negative 3.4% almost. So that's not good short term because uh, yields move inversely from uh, market values but to prices, but the good news is that we do want to see higher interest rates. Uh, Janet Yellen just made public comments about this because for savers, it, it does help to have higher rates than the extremely low rate environment we've been in. The aggregate yield, the broad U.S. index, is still only a, about 2% yield. So it's still a very low yield environment overall, particularly when you think about inflation. And you can also see that um, returns for real estate were very muted. That pro that's a property level index, the NACREF, uh, barely positive. That's been probably the most challenged part of financial markets given the pandemic, if you think about areas like office and retail in particular, they've been very challenged with the impact from the pandemic. And then uh, we'll get into this more, but strong returns in, in areas like private equity and, and commodities too. So if we can go to the next slide. Thanks. So from a global growth perspective and U.S. growth perspective, last year was a negative growth year, as you'd expect for economies given the pandemic. The outlier was actually China, which did grow positively last year, 2.3%. The US had negative growth, the Eurozone did, Japan, it was, it was what you'd expect given the pandemic, but we've seen a resurgence in growth. The second reading for US GDP for the first quarter was 6.4% and unemployment's coming down, it's now below 6%. Certainly there's still a lot of people on the sidelines, our labor force participation rate is low, but we are seeing recovery, particularly in the hardest hit sectors of the job market, like travel and leisure and, and restaurants. 
So that is good to see. We have a ways to go, but certainly there's been a lot of progress in the economy and in the job market. Next slide, please. So you, you've probably been reading about this. Uh, not all valuations are as high as, let's say, the AMC stock or GameStop, but valuations are elevated in the U.S., so we are above uh, historical long-term averages for U.S. equities. A couple things here, though, to keep in mind from a market perspective. One is that we are in a very low interest rate environment, and that has been supportive of equities, so um, pushing investors into riskier assets. The second is that uh, when we think about the portfolio, there's a couple of things there. One is that the staff has been rebalancing. We'll get to this, but the overall risk port posture and the diversification is being maintained. So the plan is not drifting away from its risk posture, and that's what we want to happen. Uh, and the second aspect is there have been some changes made to the U.S. equity structure diversifying it, and we're actually in process now on the microcap search. So microcap was approved as part of the U.S. equity allocation, and we're in process on that search with the investment office. If we go to the next slide, the we were, Bill talked about this. We're going through a fixed income structure change that was approved by the board. It's going to take time. It's being done in a methodical way through next year. But that is partly in response to the yield environment we're in. So we are in a low yield environment. Jay Klepfer will talk about that later today when we talk about the assumed rate of return for the plan. And we've made changes that the board has approved to uh, better position the fixed income portfolio for the long term given the low interest rate environment that we're in. Uh, Right now, we're at about 2% yields for, for the aggregate, so that means that uh, you're, you're basically keeping it up with inflation at that, at that rate. If we go to the next slide, please. This is an important dynamic in U.S. equities to keep in mind is that there's been a, a major shift in equities where if you think about the early days of the pandemic, the winners were the companies you would expect like online retailers, think of an Amazon as a classic example, or Netflix, stocks that did very well given the behavioral changes that we saw as a result of the pandemic. And then we've seen a shift since vaccines were approved last November. So there's a lot of data in this chart, but the point of this is to show that what was happening last year through November is different than what's happened since. So if you look at areas like energy, airlines, REITs, hotels, cruise lines, they were all the ones that were really negatively impacted by the pandemic. And then the markets tend to be ahead of the real economy. So once you saw vaccines be approved in November, you saw a leadership change in what stocks were doing the best. So overall, it's been the result of the results been very strong returns, but the sector leadership underneath the overall returns has shifted. Next slide, please. And last point I'll make here is the importance of diversification. So this is a chart we like to show on periodic table of investment returns. The point is that what leads the market changes. Uh, it, it does tend to change year in and year out. Not always, but that's typically the case. Right now, small cap stocks have been leading. Uh, and it's important to have a well-diversified portfolio knowing that. So what leads one year isn't necessarily going to lead the next. You want to have diversification by capitalization, by region, by type of investment, whether it's stocks, bonds, or other areas. That's important in terms of smoothing the path of the returns of the portfolio. So that's it on the markets. If we can go to the plan, please. The You have to go ahead a couple slides, I believe. Thank you. So this is showing the market values as the end of March, $35 billion, 35.3. And so healthy recovery from the pandemic levels. And the assets are very close to the target, as I was saying earlier. You can see the, the actual weight and the target weight for each asset class here. And in general, they're 
they're within a percentage point of their target. So that's what we want to see where you're not deviating from the asset allocation that was approved by the board, you're staying with your long-term plan. If we go to the next slide, please. Tom, excuse me, Tom, I see a hand. I see a hand. Oh, please. Mr. Jordan. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I just had a question about the valuation uh, of equities. Does the historically high valuation uh, result in any additional risk or, you know, in the event there's some kind of an adjustment to that or what impact does that have on the fund? Well, it's, it, there's what could happen in the, in the near term. It, the, the near to medium term, I'll call it, where we're potentially more susceptible to a correction or a bear market, right? Given the elevated valuations, we could argue that. The, the bear market was very short-lived last year. We, we went down 33% in the S&P in about a month. So it was a very short bear market, and then we've had a recovery back to record highs. So that is true, uh, and that's a good uh, reason to stay close to your overall long-term allocation where you don't let that drift up, you rebalance. But it does also mean longer term, and we'll talk about this this afternoon, that our expectations for equities are now lower. So we we are from we are at a higher starting point we do our capital markets assumptions based on a 10 year forward projection so it's not just what's going to happen in the next week or month or 6 months or year but it does impact those those projections and so it does mean that when we project the portfolio today we are starting from a, a higher valuation standpoint and we do have lower projected returns for equities. Hey, hey Tom, could okay. I jump in from the gallery? Sure, sure. Um, so the graph that Tom showed was what they call the CAPE, or uh, I, I guess the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, I believe is what the acronym stands for. Yeah, um, that was one yep, on there. It, yep. And that was, if you look at that metric, uh, which I've done uh, a lot, if, and you, you replicate it across the globe, what you find is that metric, while it's not a timing tool, it's not going to tell you when something's going to happen, it does give you some sort of uh, look into the future about what to expect. And when that ratio is high, like it was in the graph, it has throughout history and reliably shown that the returns you expect to receive over, say, the next decade are, are, are less and, and generally materially less than what you've experienced in the decades before. So to, to Tom's point, that has to do with what you assume uh, you're going to earn from your equities. And I think the assumption of what you're going to earn from your equities is probably, uh, of, all, of all the decisions you make, um, given this portfolio is a predominantly equity portfolio, it's probably the most important decision you make. Um, because it is what is the price setter for how you send over contribution rates or other things. So it's, it's critically important to understand that returns in today's environment are low. And how you react to that, uh, there's, there's multiple choices, but how you react to that is uh, will at least have some impact on success and, and failure over the next decade or two. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, and, and we will, this is the, the main topic probably of the, the meeting starting at 1 o'clock, so I wouldn't say this conversation is by any means over, but this helps, I think, set the table for, for the trustees and designees, hopefully. So a couple, I know we're, we're up on time here, some key points to cover. So on this slide, the, the takeaway for the board is that the overall risk posture is very close to the target. We, there's different ways we can bucket assets. One is return seeking versus capital preservation. You can see it is closely aligned. And there's actually been rebalancing since this was done. If we go to the next slide, please. The, we're going to talk about capital markets assumptions this afternoon. What I do want to highlight here is that we do look at months of benefit payments without 
employee and employer contributions, then we look at it including them. You can see that there's a healthy level of liquidity in the portfolio. So the month of benefit payments, um, if we include employee and employer contributions, the cumulative months with all these asset classes, cash, tips, and fixed income is 109.6 months. So that's the calculation that we do with the help of CERS Investment Office. And it's good to look at. We look at it every quarter to understand the liquidity. So there's cash is the most liquid, but then out from there, there is there is liquidity in the portfolio. If we go to the next slide, uh, please uh, keep going, please. This is showing the performance for the for the quarter. So Seth mentioned this at the last meeting in April. This it was a good quarter in the first quarter. We're showing this gross of fee because we need this for the attribution we do, and we do have net of fee returns starting on page 22. So I want to make sure that's clear. The net of fee return was 3.52 percent. It was 3.89 gross, and the return was was positive relative to the target with manager effect, meaning the asset allocation um, in terms of any structural differences like your small cap overweight and US equity helping and any act, impact from active management. So it was a good start to the year in terms of the first quarter. If we go to the next slide, I'll spend a little more time on that. That's showing a full year. So this was a very good year. Again, we're talking about a measurement point coming out of the pandemic. So we can't expect 31 plus percent returns every year. This was a highly unusual period, but it was good to see this recovery considering the dire days of March. So 31.42%, that's gross. The net return is 30.24%. And again, that starts on page 22. You can see the target return was 28.67. What drove the performance relative to the target, the outperformance, was the manager effect. So you had outperformance relative to the target and fixed income, U.S. equity, private credit, real estate, and emerging markets equity. And so it's really close to across the board in terms of meaningful outperformance. So that was very positive to see, and asset allocation effect was very muted in terms of impacting the overall performance. If we go to the next slide, this in uh, context of peers, you have your own asset allocation, you have your own assumed rate of return target, your own liquidity needs. There's plan-specific features that trump these types of peer comparisons, but we do look at these, so you can see that this is a very large public fund peer group, 10 billion and up peer group, and the returns relative to this peer group were solid. So if you look out a year and greater, the returns have tended to be in the second or third quarter. It's when we get out to the really long term, the 20 years, the returns are in the top decile actually, but generally speaking, they're in the second or third quartile for performance. So the performance has been solid relative to peers. And then if we go to the uh, couple slides ahead, please. There's one more slide I'd like to cover. This is looking at if we adjust the asset allocation to serves as asset allocation. So the asset allocation that you choose is a key decision, but that's, again, that's driven by factors like your liquidity needs, your assumed rate of return, what your funded status is. There's a lot of plan specific features that go into that decision. But if we do ask, adjust the asset allocation to be the same as this peer group, the in general, the peer rankings improve. So they're, if you look out uh, to the longer term periods, the three, five, and seven, they're very strong, uh, particularly over the five and seven years. So that shows that from an implementation perspective that we've seen improvement in uh, the SERS portfolio, which is good to see as well. So a positive story overall in terms of what's been a very strong recent return environment and in terms of SERS's absolute performance and relative performance compared to peers. So I'll stop here. I know there's other agenda items and see if there's any questions or comments before we move on. Uh, this is Alan Slanik and I 
comment? Please go ahead. Um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, really draw everybody's attention to this slide uh, a little bit more. I mean, this is this is really a significant slide, in my opinion. I mean, this is, you know, how well is the staff and the team that we've hired, you know, implementing the asset allocation as we've, you know, asked them to do. And for us to be at the, you know, for the five-year period, you know, sixth percentile and for the seven-year period, you know, number one in the country, I mean, you know, you, you, you can't ask for any better, you know, implementation than that. And so that really is a huge credit to staff that they're, you know, when they are picking managers, they're picking good managers, they're implementing this cost efficiently and effectively um, and doing a good job, uh, you know, from a, from a manager picking side. So really wanted to give staff a big, a big shout out and, and thanks for that because, you know, this is really, really significant and strong performance on this respect. So thank you. Thanks for highlighting that, Alan. Appreciate that. Uh, staff appreciates it too, Alan. <laughs> Okay, That's, that concludes our presentation, Chairman Becker. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom and team. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll carry on if it's okay, Glenn. Um, so the next step is a private equity opportunity of Insight Partners. Um, <clears throat> as you know, we, the, uh, the target for private equity was reduced the last meeting. Um, this opportunity was otherwise in the pipeline, if you will. It was sort of queued up to launch um, even before that occurred. So what what this w is or what it represents is probably the last private equity opportunity you'll see for the year and potentially longer depending on how the, um, the modeling, the commitment modeling works. But certainly for the rest of the year, it seems like we'll be on hold. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as you go through this that uh, this was in the queue before the reduction occurred uh, and we felt like we needed to follow through on it. And uh, in addition to that, uh, it, will be, it will be the last one you see for, for several months. Uh, Dave, you're up, buddy. Okay, thank you, Seth. Um, Insight Partners 12 um, is an existing relationship, um, serves as investors in six prior funds. Um, Insight is raising um, their fund 12 targeting 11.5 11, $11 billion. The group is very transparent and has um, shown um, great diversity. Um, I'll have Anika from um, Insight um, discuss that. This fund is a technology software fund in the uh, growth equ equity space. They've delivered outstanding returns and terms are market. I'm going to have Mike Elio um, provide some commentary from StepStone. Mike? Sure, Dave. Uh, this is my inside partners. They're here today, so they'll walk you through the presentation. But as a, at a high level, look, this is one of the leading private equity firms. They've been around since 1995. As Dave mentioned, they're focused on uh, growth stage software, software-enabled services, and internet companies globally. But of course, their focus is on U.S. companies. Um, as we know, private equity can no longer use financial engineering to generate returns, and Insight has one of the um, most established operations groups internally called the Insight Onsite Team. Um, it's over 75 people strong and growing, and it has also helped drive a very low loss ratio within this portfolio. Um, this is a straight down the fairway um, relationship that you've had for some time. Their performance has been near top decile with a 2.4x multiple 25% net return. It has outperformed pretty much on every metric that we can use. So um, even though this may be the last PE commitment for a little while, it's a great one for us to squeeze in um, in the short term. So with that, I do believe we have the GP here on the line who can walk through further details. You, of course, have our full memo um, with additional detail on the manager. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Anika and Conrad? Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Anika Agrawal. I'm a partner at Insight. Uh, looking forward to sharing the Insight story. Um, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, can we jump to the next slide? Uh, one more. Perfect. Thanks. 
Right. So Insight uh, was founded uh, over 25 years ago to invest in growing software businesses. Um, our investment committee has worked together for over 20 years, and over our history, we've invested almost $25 billion across 400 companies and made 25, 250 add-on acquisitions uh, within the portfolio. We've also had a broad set of exit events, including sales to strategics, sponsors, and over 45 IPOs. Uh, next slide, please. So our focus has always been on finding the best software companies around the world. And if you look at the median growth rate at investment, it's actually increased over time um, as software com companies continue to capture a larger and larger share of the economy and take advantage of all the growth opportunities. Uh, we focus on both minority and majority transactions, and our flexibility has actually enabled us to take advantage of the best opportunities. So you'll see that the mix shift between control and minority investments has been, um, you know, uh, varied a little bit through the through the years, but ultimately we find that that actually enables us to build really great relationships with founders, and founders appreciate that when we're getting to know them, when we're getting to know their business, we're less focused about trying to force a certain transaction type or structure onto them and more about finding a way to help them grow. Um, and, you know, we can figure out the structure and, and that part of the deal uh, later. Um, many of our deals might start out as a minority deal. And as we get more excited about the opportunities, we learn more about the business, we might ultimately flip to a majority or in certain cases, vice versa. But the flexible structure really enables us to just find great companies and find ways to help them grow. Uh, next slide. So we invest globally, and particularly in the past decade, we've really expanded our focus um, from the U.S. to also include Europe, Israel, and Asia. Many of our companies are U.S.-based companies that want to expand internationally, and they really appreciate our relationships and knowledge um, across the world. Uh, you know, conversely, many of our European and Israeli companies have built great technologies but really want to expand to the U.S. and other parts of the world. Um, and, and our, our knowledge of the space, our access to customers, our access to investors, um, and ultimately, you know, our understanding of, of how to build a global software business um, is, is very valuable relative to other firms that might just focus on a specific geography. Uh, next slide, please. So we think we're just getting started in terms of the opportunities within software and SaaS. Um, you know, we've been doing this for 25 years, and we think the next uh, 10 to 15 years are going to bring, you know, even more growth and opportunity. Um, we expect the spend on software to double and the spend on SaaS to quadruple in the next 10 years. As software continues to automate and revolutionize every enterprise and consumer interaction, I continue to be amazed every day by how many processes in the business world are still based on pen and paper and how, many, how much data is still recorded in people's heads. And so, you know, we're very excited for what's ahead in terms of insight as we continue to play a leadership role in, in helping software companies scale and, and continuing to, to automate, you know, more and more aspects of, of the world. Uh, next slide. So our focus on software, we think, really helps us in, in, in all three aspects of, of investing in companies. So first, on the sourcing front, it enables us to find opportunities um, in a way that firms that are, you know, more broadly focused might not. So we have you know, almost 50 people that wake up every day helping us to find new opportunities. They call tens of thousands of companies every year um, around the world and, um, you know, get to know the entrepreneurs, get to know the businesses, get to know their markets. And ultimately, you know, those tens of thousands of calls result in, you know, 50 to 100 new deals. Um, but, but because they only do software and because they understand um, how to think about growth and the pattern matching and identifying growth, growth and great growth businesses. Um, you know, our sourcing effort is is really uh, unique and and um, and very differentiated. Uh, the second part um, is selecting. So our investment team is is another uh, you know 40 people who have been investing for over 25 years and um, you know really um, leverage our experience and our understanding to, to find the best investments. And, you know, every Monday we get together, we, you know, talk about 10 or 15 investments and, and select the, the few that, that we ultimately, we want to want to be part of the story for. And then the, the third leg of the stool is our operating team. That's the onsite team that was mentioned earlier. Um, that's a team of, you know, over 80 people that is a mix of former consultants, um, who've worked in strategy and analytics and a mix of former operators who've, 
led sales, product, marketing, customer success at software companies and bring to bear their experience um, and their knowledge into running our businesses. Um, and so, you know, we believe that ultimately, you know, scaling a software business from 10 to 50 to 100 million of revenue has a lot of similar opportunities, a lot of similar challenges. And so, um, you know, they're able to codify and, and really, you know, bring their best practices to, to helping us scale our businesses. Next slide, please. Uh, and one more. Thank you. So at Insight, we believe that our DEI responsibility extends beyond the firm to our portfolio companies and the broader software ecosystem. We want to support the next generation of entrepreneurs and leaders. A few years ago, we were primarily focused on gender diversity. Uh, Hillary, Rachel, and I were the three female partners at Insight, and we wanted to increase the number of women at the firm. We launched a number of initiatives, including networking events at targeting schools specifically for women and ensuring that each female candidate we interviewed with had at least one woman from Insight. As a result, over the past few years, our incoming analyst classes have been half men and half women. And in total, we now have 25 women on the investment team. We've since expanded our focus to include ethnic, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic diversity. On the portfolio front, we convened a diverse group of 10 CEO CEOs across the portfolio and work with them to create a DE&I pledge. Beyond the first 10 companies, we have a waiting list of 20 additional portfolio companies that want to participate in the pledge. We also have a new clause in our term sheets that requires companies to re report diversity measures. Yeah. Sorry, was there a question? Okay. Um, that, that, sorry, uh, we have a new clause in our term sheets that requires companies to re report diversity metrics and consider at least one diverse candidate for each executive and board level search. Um, I would like to read you the CEO DEI pledge. As the founder or chief executive officer of a scale up company, I seek to ensure that my organization comprises individuals of various genders, races, ethnicities, nationalities, sexual orientations, ages, socioeconomic statuses, religions, physical abilities, and more. I commit to use my influence and means to build a fair and inclusive company in which we recruit and retain a diverse workforce and leaders. As a company, we will report our progress toward this goal. This pledge coming from the top of our company sends a powerful message to all our constituents that this is a priority for us. And in the broader ecosystem, my partners and I set aside capital to create a new fund called Vision Capital that invests in diverse emerging managers focused on early stage software. A number of their investments have already secured follow on funding and we're excited to support this extraordinary group of GPs. Thank you. Any questions uh, for Insight? Okay, I, and again, I'll, I'll just as a reminder, this is the uh, last. Mr. Rocco has his hand up. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Mr. Rocco has his hand up. Yep, uh, Dan. Th th thank you very much for your presentation uh, and your documents, and thank you for for successfully making money for our pension system over over our several commitments with you. In your opinion, your efforts that you just talked about in diversity and pledges and in seeking out talent. Do you think that these efforts help you become more profitable or more successful? Talk about the relationship, if you can, briefly, about how these efforts um, uh, assist your company and, and then obviously assist us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we think we're just getting started on our, you know, r road toward building, you know, uh, a diverse and, and inclusive culture um, at Insight. But yes, uh, the progress that we've made so far and the progress that we hope to make um, in the future is absolutely making us more successful. Uh, we think um, our uh, diversity enables us to uh, source a broader range of interesting companies that enables us to make more interesting and better investment decisions, uh, add more value to our portfolio companies, and ultimately, you know, generate better returns for yourselves and for, um, and, you know, for, for our broader group of LPs. So, yes, we think, you know, the diversity that we've added helps in all aspects of, of making us a successful investor. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? 
Okay. Uh, just, just as a bit of reminder, again, this will be the last opportunity you see for a, a little bit. Um, on top of that, you can begin to see why earning, uh, you know, with Tom's presentation about expected returns, why trying to earn as much as you can from the equities you have becomes very important. Um, and, and so this, again, is what the private equity allocation is intended to do, really, is earn more money than public equity, uh, about 20 percent more if you were to put uh, pen to paper. Um, and, and that's that's really all we have for this presentation. And uh, we'll turn it back over to Glenn for the motion. Good. Thank you, Seth. And uh, thank you, Anika and Conrad, for a very a good presentation. Um, so a motion is in order. And let me read the motion. Uh, a motion is in order to recommend that the State Employees Retirement Board commit up to $50 million to Insight Partner 12 LP plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with executed partnership documents as a follow-on investment within the private equity asset class subject to successful completion of contract negotiations and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties, including required Commonwealth legal approvals within 12 months. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Um, if there's no further discussion, um, uh, Jim, may we have a roll call uh, vote, please? Jim's on mute. Uh, Jim's. <laughs> yes, Chair Becker, we'll start with uh, you, please. Uh, yes, I. Thank you. Mr. Urban, on behalf of Senator DeSanto. Aye. Mr. Fillman. Aye. Mr. Aqua, on behalf of Representative Frankel. Aye. Thanks, Dan. Treasurer Garrity. Um, I'm going to vote no, and um, I'll explain why. It's due to the uh, the fee terms that serves heavy allocation to tech in its private equity portfolio the overall weight to PEE. Um, additionally, there's no third-party administrator or SOC 1, uh, no third-party valuation, and no entertainment reporting policy. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Malchowski, on behalf of Senator Hughes. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Mr. Thal. Aye. Thank you. And Mr. Flanagan, on behalf of Secretary Begg. Aye. Okay. All eyes except one no, Chairman Becker. Good. Uh, thank you, Jim. So the uh, the motion is passed. Thank you, uh, everyone. Appreciate that. And um, Seth, do we uh, anything further with you? I know we have some informational items. I don't know if you wanted to make a few comments about that first. Uh, no, no comments. They're, they're informational only in, unless there's questions. And then uh, I would turn it back over to you for um, executive session. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Um, we are going to break uh, for executive session. Now there's the, the normal informational items uh, have been put in board docs, which you've seen. Uh, we also have a personnel matter uh, to discuss. And I would ask, does anybody have any questions on the informational items? We could have Seth or someone from the investment office join us at the beginning of this executive session. Otherwise, we'll just go uh, for the uh, for the other matter. Any any questions for the investment office before we break? Okay, hearing none, I, I think we are ready to break for executive session. And uh, Jeff, do you tee that up for us? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. At this point of the meeting, the committee is scheduled to discuss uh, agency business uh, regarding a uh, personnel matter, and therefore um, it is appropriate for executive session. Before we enter executive session, please give us a minute to take, make a few technical changes uh, here in the boardroom on your behalf. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and is now being live streamed. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody. We are now back in the uh, public session. And uh, we did have 
um, an executive session to discuss uh, the personnel matter. And in light of uh, the resignation of, of uh, Seth Kelly, our CIO, we had a discussion um, really uh, just uh, regarding the appropriate next steps in the oversight of the uh, SERS portfolio. And um, we would, um, first, I would like to um, thank um, Seth for his service uh, to the State Employees Retirement System and to the Commonwealth. Uh, while his tenure was not long, um, he, it, we did accomplish a great deal, I think, during your time here. And you give us, gave us some fresh ideas in looking at the portfolio. And I uh, personally have enjoyed working with you and wish you the best in your future endeavors. And um, we, for the next step going forward, uh, I have a motion uh, that I would uh, like to read. The motion's in order. So a, a motion is in order to recommend that the State Employees Retirement Board appoint Deputy Chief Investment Officer James G. Nolan as Acting Chief Investment Officer with the powers and duties of the Chief Investment Officer, such appointment to be effective June 11, 2021, and continue until the Board determines otherwise. And the Board agrees and grants James G. Nolan a temporary 5% hourly pay increase effective June 11, 2021, and to continue until the board determines otherwise. Uh, may I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. Second. And, thank you. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. May we have a roll call vote, please? I'm not sure if they're back on the line. Would you want me to do that? Okay. Would you, you do Mr. That? Becker? That sure. Yes. Sure. Let's start with you, Mr. Becker. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I was uh, just kidding. I believe it was Chuck Erdman on behalf of Senator DeSanto. Aye. Mr. Philman. Aye. Uh, Dan Ocko on behalf of Representative Frankel. Aye. Uh, Treasurer Garrity. Aye. Tony Markowski on behalf of Senator Hughes. Aye. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Mr. Thal? Aye. Alan Flanagan on behalf of uh, Secretary Vig. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, uh, Jim is back on. Uh, we uh, welcome, uh, this, we appreciate your moving into this role and look forward to continuing to work with you. And uh, at, I guess now we're at uh, any additional comments, uh, committee comments, or questions or comments from those not on the committee before we uh, adjourn? Uh, hearing none, our next meeting is July 27. And uh, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. So moved. So okay. second. Great. Thank you. Okay. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. And next up is finance and member services, I believe, at uh, 1 o'clock. Thank you.